Thank you very much for the nice introduction. I hope you can hear me and I hope it's not confusing that I'm watching in this direction, not here because the camera and screen are different here. Um, good, but well, let's get started. Um, the, the title is a little bit more exotic than, than, than most people know, but I try to guide you through this and give you a nice uh, overview about this topic. So let's start with some, let's, yeah, no. With some classical imaging and spectroscopy at the beginning, because I mean, everybody is familiar with this. And what you all know is that if you have some tissue like that is sketched here by the brain and you want to make some microscopy or imaging with this, you illuminate it with a light source and behind you put a camera and then you image what, what uh, light goes through this. And the same is true if you do spectroscopy, you add a dispersive element and then you can do spectroscopy tasks. The only issue here is that most of those applications because of the given detector technology are limited to the visible range. Yeah, I mean, if you check your, your smartphones, they have super good cameras, they are cheap and good performing, but only in the visible range. And this is actually what, what drives the technology development there. This means that uh, a lot of the electro electromagnetic spectrum is actually not very much used for, for um, spectroscopy and imaging tasks, like in the infrared terahertz or also in the DPOV range. Also, there's actually a lot of interesting things to observe, for example, in life science, if you want to do some chemical selective imaging, you actually would need to go to the infrared and terahertz range to see the, uh, the, the, vibration, the vibrations of molecules. Yeah? And this actually is a, a limit that we try to overcome. And actually I try to, to always sketch it with this magic triangle of imaging. Yeah, one has a given detector. Let me quickly turn on the laser pointer. Yes, you have a given detector technology. You have some wavelength range uh, of interest for the sample interaction. And at the end, you have some imaging, uh, image quality uh, that you want to have, so like contrast or resolution. And it's not possible to enhance all of them at the same time. As an example, if you go for CMOS technology, so you take cheap and uh, very good performing um, CCD chips or CMOS chips, you cannot do imaging in the, uh, in the terahertz range. And if you would like to do imaging in the terahertz range, you cannot expect it to have a molecular resolution. Yeah? And actually, this is where imaging uh, or quantum imaging comes into play. It tries to break this, this magic triangle and tries to increase all of those things, three points at the same time. So with a given detector technology, make all of the wavelengths available for detection. Ideally, but let's see, but ideally with also the, all the requirements on image quality. Yeah, good. And the basic idea that, that is behind this is actually that you use correlated or entangled photon pairs and it's sketched like here. So you have a nonlinear material, ideally a, a nonlinear crystal and you pump it with some photon and inside it can split into two uh, partner photons. And this photon pair can actually also be degenerated. So have different wavelengths. And the nice thing that if they are entangled, they're also correlated. So they share some properties with each other. And the idea is to have one of those photons in, a, in the wavelength range where you have this all this good detector and optics technology, yeah? And the other partner photon will be in an extreme wavelength range, like in the deep UV, in the mid infrared, or in the terahertz range. And then you use this one for the interaction with the sample, and you use the partner photon in the visible for making the actual detection on the camera, yeah? And therefore, of course, you can reduce any phototoxicity just uh, imagine you have an MER detector, which is always very low in the, in the detection efficiency. You can overcome this thing because you actually use a visible range detector. Therefore, the detection efficiency is much increased. So you also need less light to interact with the sample. Especially in life science, this can actually matter because there are also substances that are photosensitive, so you cannot shine too much light onto them. Okay, most people of you uh, for sure no ghost imaging and this is just in a nutshell what is ghost imaging and as a warning the talk will not be about ghost imaging but just to put you on all in the same on the same stage ghost imaging is like a first a half a step to to achieve the spectral um the spectral benefit as you see only the red photons interact with the uh, with the object and all the yellow photons go on the camera but since the red photons when they are reflected by the object trigger the camera in the coincidence measurement, you can still see the object on the camera. Yeah, I mean, this is like already half of the solution to what we want to have, because as you saw, 
the light that goes to the camera did not interact with the object, but on the downside of the story is you still have to have the, the, the red photons that interacted with the object be detected at, at the single pixel detector here. And if this single pixel detector does not exist for your wavelength range, you cannot apply this technology. And if it's very poor on um, detection efficiency, the overall efficiency is limited actually by this detection efficiency. So it's not actually the best solution to go for ghost imaging if you want to overcome the spectral pro uh, problem for the, for the detection of exotic wavelength ranges. So therefore, there's a more suitable technique called imaging with undetected photons. And I try to, to motivate it from some scratch and try to explain it from scratch how it works. And therefore, we have to go back to some very fundamental concept, which is a Mach 10 on the parameter. And most of you are familiar with this. If you shine laser light in, so you have here a beam splitter with a 50-50 ratio. And here you have another beam splitter with a 50-50 ratio. And if you shine coherent light in, then you know all the light comes out of this uh, detector port uh, D2 because you have a pi over two phase jump in the reflection channels at both of the beam splitters. There you have here destructive interference and here you have constructive interference. This is not very new. Now the, the thing is also, which is also not new, you can introduce some phase difference here, yeah, some phase object, for example, and then you can make this phase, so this additional optic path length, so to say, visible via the interference fringes. So good so far. Now the question is, what happens if I take a single photon? Yeah, if I take a single, single photon, naively one could say, okay, it can take the other path, it's split up here 50-50, or it takes the lower path and it's split again 50-50. So what I naively would expect is, I have half of times count at D1, and the other half I have counts at D2. But of course, if I ask, ask it like this, it's not correct. I also have the same as with the coherent light. I have only counts at D2 at the end, because I have the same properties, yeah, the single photon behaves as a coherent wave. It goes actually both ways, yeah, and there's again destructive interference, constructive interference, therefore I have counts only at this output channel. Okay, and I couldn't do the same thing. I can put some, some object in and I see again interference ranges just in the probabilities, not in the intensities. Okay, now the, the, the thing is what, what I would like to claim here is that this effect only works because I, I have no which pass information. Yeah? On the other hand, this means if I could mark which of the paths the photon actually has taken, yeah, then I could distinguish those things and then it should not work the way it, as it worked before. So this interference should break down and I should gain counts here and counts here, half of them here and half of them here. So again, this is just a claim and one can actually prove this in the Gedanken experiment just put a half wave blade in the upper arm to mark the polarization, put it at 22 point, uh, at 45 degree. So you flip the rotation, uh, you rotate the polarization, you flip it. And then of course, where the get out is really this 50-50 distribution between the two detectors. Yeah, and to summarize, this means that if I have which path information, if I somehow gain this information, the photon behaves like a particle, like a billiard ball, it really goes either the upper way or the lower way, and it's split here 50-50. Yeah, so there's no coherence in my system. But if I uh, um, erase this rich path information, so if I have no rich path information, there's a coherence in my system, the photon behaves like a wave again, and I have what we just discussed, all the photons will come out to detector D2. Yeah, okay. Of course, why does this work? Because I mean, rays, uh, so part, uh, photons are quanta, so they have wave and particle characters, characteristics, so both of them work together in a nice way. And now we take it one step further. So we now do not use a simple Mach 10 under parameter. Now we use a nonlinear Mach 10 under parameter. As you see here in the sketch, so you have again, now we, no, not again, now you have a pump laser, which is split here at the first beam splitter, and it ca can pump this nonlinear crystal, or it can pump the second nonlinear crystal. Yeah, they are, those are both identical nonlinear crystals. Then here you have a dichroidic mirror separating the green Eisler photons going down and realign it also with the, with the output of the second nonlinear crystal. The red signal photons, they go this way here. And from the second crystal, they, in the first one, they will be overlapped at the second uh, beam splitter. And the two output channels will be imaged, for example, on the camera. Yeah? And if you arrange a setup like this, then you have a very nice property that your pump photon either makes the down conversion in the first crystal or it makes the down conversion in the second crystal. 
Yeah, and both possibilities are indistinguishable to each other. This means you either have idler light generated from the first crystal and interacting with the object, or you have idler light only generated in the second crystal and not interacting with the object. This would mean if I would place a detector, for example, here at this position, checking the green idler light, yeah, this detector could not tell if the screen idler light was generated in the, in the second crystal and did not see the object, or if it was created in the first crystal and did see the object. So both possibilities will interfere because they are indistinguishable and it could see this interference, so it could see this object. And now comes the very cool thing is that idler and signal are correlated to each other, so I can see the very same behavior also on the signal light. Yeah? And the two outputs here are actually just being the constructive and the destructive interference port. Meaning that, so this is really the essence, I can image or I can put those red signal light on the camera and see the object which was actually illuminated by this green idler light. Or put it in other words, the light that creates the image on the camera did never interact with the object. And the light that interacts with the object is just sent to Nirvana. I don't detect it at all. There is no, no single pixel camera, no trigger, nothing. Yeah, just to see a normal camera. And actually this works. I will show you some example images uh, in some minutes, so be patient, please. So, and <clears throat> actually the thing goes back to, to uh, the work of Mandel, yeah? And there's a nice paper, induced coherence without induced emission. And therefore sometimes it's also called the Mandel effect. And this is actually a very cool effect that can be used for actually what we want to have, right? I mean, you can now do the imaging in different spectral range than the actual interaction with the object. And it was pioneered in the, in the group of Anton Zeilinger and Leonid Krivitsky. Um, the Zeilinger group, they showed first time that it can be really used for imaging. And minutes. two minutes left only. Okay, yeah. I, have to, I have to speed up. So then I, I speed it a little bit up. So what we want to overcome is that we do not want to have a setup looking like this. We really want to make it more compact. And we change it, for example, from a Mach center to a Michelson configuration. Yeah, this is one of the first steps. And it's there, everything works. And we could already put it in a transportable box. So only in this upper part, there's actually an imaging setup inside. It can run live. You have here some knob to put a sample in and out. This is already a very first achievement if you want to transport it out of the optics lab into the life science lab. Yeah. And now what is inside the box? What is just explained to you? There's a single crystal, PPKTP in our case. There's idler and signal. In this arm, you have the object. In the other arm, not. And we only image the red light on the camera at the end. And just we can skip the time pressure. So this is our first object that we put in. So this really uh, was a, a little happy face. And these are the first images that we could uh, see with, with, uh, with the setup. Yeah, you see the constructive, you see the destructive interference image. And of course, if you subtract them from each other, you get a, get a different image. And also what we noticed, if you take a better camera, for example, a CMOS camera, which is actually even cheaper than the EMCCD camera, we get some really nice images. This is only the constructive interference image. Yeah, so proof of principle, this really works well, also in a very compactified version. Yeah, and some people say, okay, how many minutes did you, did you use for, for acquired images? It was actually 100 milliseconds. Yeah, so it works also very fast. And you could even go down to video rates, so 20 milliseconds. So you see here some videos and some uh, smiley, happy faces that are blinking, so saying hello from the quantum world. And this was actually a very nice thing that it can be done in video rate as well. Good. Then, as you saw, this works really well. So we can have constructive, destructive, contrast, enhanced one. And what we also checked is, what is the resolution that we have at the moment? And we noticed it's a rough, roughly around 60 micrometers. So we have here an object where the smallest structure is 60 micrometers. One can clearly resolve it here, yeah, and this hashtag next. And so it should be around somewhere around 50 micrometer the resolution. And at the moment, it's only limited by the objects that we use. So it's not limited by the, by the principle itself, just the optical components right now. Good. And we also got a little bit closer. So we zoomed in a little bit and did some, some imaging over some whole interference phase range. And we saw that actually the, the that this works quite well. So if you really make a, a specific measurement here, we end up with uh, 53 micrometer. And also we noticed we measured it again. So there's, it was specified with 60 micrometer, but it actually was even a little bit smaller at the end. So this worked quite well. And with this, I would like to summarize. 
So I was surprised that the time is running so fast. So imaging with undetected photons allows you to capture images in extreme spectral ranges. So that, that this way you can cover the UV, the mid-infrared, and also the terahertz range by only detecting visible light, which is a which can make a huge impact for especially for biomedical imaging. Yeah, because there, especially in the long wavelength range, you have a lot of applications and you can overcome severe issues that you face there. And what we could show in our work so far is that a stable, robust, and also a portable implementation can be done. And we can also run this comp compactified setup at video rate. And with this, I would like to put the credits to the funding agencies and, of course, to the people that actually uh, make this work in the crew possible. Especially for this work, there was uh, Sebastian, Marta, and Joshua uh, involved. And so a big thank you to those people there. And now I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions.